Welcome to Circular City Week, New York, 2021. And welcome to this panel, the state of circular practices in the design, architecture, and furnishing industry created by Laurent Scar Inc. We are going to kick off with a few words from Ton Sondergaard, the founder of Circular City Week. Ton, thank you for being here with us and over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you and welcome to everyone out there. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining this wonderful Circular City Week affiliated event. As Lawrence have kind of already told you, um, Circular City Week is this week-long festival that we by the Danish Clean Tech Cup are organizing for the third year in a row. And we, back in the days, started Circular City Week because we really wanted to create a platform where we could knowledge share and, uh, and create partnerships related to this new and amazing emerging topic on circular economy. And it's been really amazing to see how the week developed since we started it back in 2019, um, because it just grows and gets bigger every year, which is absolutely amazing. So uh, this year, we have more than 200 speakers joining us from all over the world. There is 90 events going on throughout the week. So if you're not signed up for many of the other amazing events, I can highly recommend checking out circularcityweek.com. But uh, more so, it's of course due to our more than 100 hosts and partners that are essentially creating all the content for this amazing week. So thank you so much to you, Lawrence, for creating an amazing event and panel like this. Uh, I think we all agree that, uh, especially within architecture and the furnishing industry these days, there's just so many things going on. So uh, it's really exciting to be joining you today. And I so look forward to, to hearing what all of you have to share and what's going on in your respective fields. So very, very excited about that. And before giving the floor back to, to you again, Lawrence, I just want to also do a shout out to our pioneer partners this year. It's ABB, Arab, NYSERDA, Freshfields, Dell and Rubicon, because without them, we couldn't create this open platform where everyone can participate and talk about what the circular future looked like and be part of the movement. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for being here and have a wonderful week and a wonderful event. Thanks so much, Tone. Um, that is great uh, that you were here um, and you shared more about Circular City Week. We hope this year is the best one yet. Welcome everyone. I am Laurence Gar and I am your host. By way of introduction, I am the CEO and creative director of Laurence Gar Inc. Interior design studio specializing in residential and hospitality environments that emphasizes sustainability, health, and wellness. Please stay in touch by following us on social at Laurence Car Design. And now let's start with um, our presentation. Let me take you through how we are going to spend the time um, for the next uh, hour. Our panel discussion will last for about 45 minutes. We set aside 10 minutes of Q&A. And as we go along, please share any questions that might come up in the Q&A section. We will try to address as many as possible. And then we'll wrap up. But before we get into it, let me frame up the discussion. This slide contains a quote from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world with 8.7 trillion assets under management. They invest in pretty much everything <clears throat> from public and private companies to real estate to infrastructure. Just to put the size of BlackRock into perspective, there are only two countries in the world with a gross domestic product or GDP larger than BlackRock's assets under management, and that is the US and China. Each year, Mr. Fink writes a letter to CEOs and the following quote is from his 2021 letter. Last year, we wrote to you that BlackRock was making sustainability our new standard for investing. We outlined how we were making sustainability integral to the way we manage risk, generate alpha, build portfolios and pursue investment stewardships in order to help improve your investment outcomes. We made this commitment on the strength of a deeply held investment conviction, 
that integrating sustainability can help investors build more resilient portfolio and achieve better long-term readjusted returns. In short, BlackRock has been quite explicit about its view on the threats to our planet. And it has publicly committed to take a stand first by insisting companies are transparent about their efforts to enhance sustainability. And second, by making investment towards companies that make sustainability, that take sustainability seriously. Mr. Fink goes on to observe that the pandemic has accelerated this trend. In fact, between 2019 and 2020, capital in sustainable investment funds increased by 96%. And investment in companies disclosing environmental and sustainability metrics increased by 363%. This is part of a global trend. The value of global assets applying environmental, social, and governance, ECG data, to drive investment decisions that almost doubled over four years and more than tripled over eight years to 40.5 trillion in 2020. The message is clear. A company's or organization's commitment to sustainability really matters to investors. It affects the ability to raise capital, get a loan, and how the company is valued. Now, if sustainability matters to investors, it certainly matters to consumers. According to Nielsen, a research company, consumers will spend 150 billion this year on sustainable consumer brands. The shift in consumer buying behavior is certainly true in fashion brands, which you see a selection of here. But even more surprising is the effect on consumer goods. Products you would buy in the supermarket for food as well as cleaning products and beyond. A study was recently contacted by NYU Stern School of Sustainable Business and IRI, a data company. They tracked 73,000 packaged goods in 36 categories from 2015 to 2020 using data collected at the point of purchase. Over that period, the share of sustainable products increased faster than other products. But amazingly, the growth of sustainable products accounted for 55% of the growth across all consumer products. That is to say, consumer preference for sustainable product is not marginal. It has already emerged and is, is accounting for most of the growth in consumer goods. Our industry is no different. According to GW2 Intelligence, 86% of consumers agree that building and furnishing manufacturers, companies and brands continue to deplete finite resources and are stealing from the future. Whether it's structures, interiors, furniture, appliances, textiles or paints, consumers are speaking with their wallets and the demand for transparency chemical-free products, as well as healthy materials with standard certification is growing. Consumers want great designs that do not negatively affect the climate or our health. It is simply no longer true that there is a trade-off between sustainability and quality of beauty or elegance. I have been espousing this for quite some time in my own design practice, but it is truer today than ever before. So why do I say all of this? Because for the last two years, I have presented about the circular economy and sustainable practices. The discussions have largely been explanatory and educational. What is the circular economy and how does it work? But today, the train has already left the station. Sustainability has moved beyond something that we should do on moral grounds. It is now something that no business can ignore. It is driving how investors value a business. It is what consumers care about. And it is, it is the driver of growth across multiple industries. The question today for those who may have been sitting on the sidelines is less, should we consider circular practices, but more, how do we get started? And that leads me to the topic of today's panel. We are going to be discussing solutions we are going to be discussing how to start the journey. 
each of our panelists are pioneers at embracing circular practices and therefore qualified to provide ideas for how to start to move businesses and supply chains toward more circular and sustainable practices. I am especially honored to be joined by such distinguished individuals who are not only advocates, but also true practitioner of environmental conscious practices and products. Susan Ingle, Executive Director at the Sustainable Furnishing Council. Walter Brigham, Senior Designer, Development Manager at Lensing Fiber. Mark Phillips, Founder and President at Phillips Collection. Jason Phillips, Vice President at Phillips Collection. And Ramash Opash, Associate Professor of Product Design at Parsons Venue School. I will be moderating this discussion. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. So please each of you tell our audience a little more about yourself, what you do and why circularity is important to you and your business. Suzanne, let's start with you. Thank you so much, Laurence. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I am Susan Ingalls, a direct sustainable furnishings council and we are a membership organization in the residential furnishings industry. We've got nearly 400 member companies now that are involved in the furniture industry in various ways. So they might supply materials or manufacture any number of furnishings products or be stores or design firms. And each of these companies has made their own public and verifiable commitment to sustainability and to transparency and to continuous improvement. And of course, company commitments vary, but circularity has to do with all of it, whether the company is most focused on reducing energy consumption or most focused on supply chain management or most focused on telling a powerful marketing story. In all cases, incorporating circularity is an important and necessary tool. So that's why I'm interested. Thank you, Suzanne. Walter? Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I come from a long background of retail. So I worked for Macy's for 33 years from stores, buying product development for many major brands in home textiles and in um, hard goods. Um, from that, I had a great experience working with um, a mill out of Bahrain, a West Point home who does who wear they had a lot of focus on sustainability um, where I got involved with it at that point. Um, from that, I have moved to Lansing where I am now as a senior business development manager. And what, what is interesting to me about circularity is that knowing how products are built and all the global sourcing and what the cons consumers are looking for now, we can from Lensing's point of view, we can be at the very beginning stages and we can help so many companies in their journeys to bring circularity and sustainability to their products than to the end consumer. So that's what I would um, add as far as my like passion. It's like starting from the beginning and really helping people through that journey, connecting, educating and all that wonderful stuff. That's what, that's what it is for me. Thank you, Walter. Mark? I'm Mark Phillips, President and CEO of Phillips Collection. We are an organic contemporary furniture manufacturer and our roots, pun intended, are paramount to our philosophy and the way we approach everything. We work with castaway pieces of wood and resources that are neglected and with our design skills, redeploy these into lovely and inspiring pieces of art that you can enjoy in your home. Our tagline, Every Piece of Conversation, talks about our story and how we go to preserve the resources and how we bring this product to market. Thank you so much, Mark. Jason? Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Phillips. I'm also with Phillips Collection. I'm Mark's son. 
Uh, it's been an incredible journey working in our family business where, as Dad just said, we go around the world finding intriguing objects. Uh, more my focus has been on that conversation with our customer, which is interior designers and furniture dealers, but also with the consumer. So I look at circularity not only on our production side, but that story and that engagement with our audience and how that needs to be, as, as many have mentioned, transparent and part of the conversation. Thank you, Jason. Rama? Yeah, my name is Rama Korpakash, and I'm um, an industrial designer and a professor at Parsons. <clears throat> my, um, my, my own practice uh, really started in, in global mass production designing for companies like Herman Miller and Swatch Watch, um, working at a very large scale. And I've shifted uh, a major part of my practice to looking at, at, at local production in cities for cities to really look at how to shorten the supply chain in terms of shipping and things like that. Um, as, a, as the founder of our MFA industrial design program at Parsons, many of the same tensions um, occur in, in the programs as well. So I look at um, the, the dichotomies between um, uh, uh, different areas of scale and production. Thank you, Rama. Suzanne, you lead the Sustainable Furnishing Council, a coalition of manufacturers, retailers, and designers dedicated to raising awareness and expanding the adoption of environmentally sustainable practices across the home furnishings industry. Its mission is to help companies reduce their environmental footprints as they grow and to help consumers find healthy furnishings. You and your team recently created a series of acting active working groups with the trade on different topics on sustainability. What are some of the aspects the trade struggles with in becoming more circular? Um, we are a, um, a very complex industry. We are an industry in residential furnishings with very complex supply chains. And that does present areas for struggle. We are making and selling goods. We are also selling services, design services. But even those um, services result in the creation and distribution of more goods. And all of that results in a lot of waste. The challenge is that not enough of that waste makes its way into the supply chain as a feedstock. The result is that what we humans throw away these days is the world's most abundant natural resource for feedstocks. And in furnishings, we are challenged by a lack of infrastructure for taking advantage of that and also by the fact that we use a lot of harmful chemicals in our processes that actually impede recyclability. So even though a certain fiber might be perfectly recyclable, if it has chemicals added to it, perhaps for stain repellency, that could impede the recyclability of that fiber. So those are some of the, the kinds of challenges. I do want to mention that we have a missed opportunity in not building infrastructure and in not um, uh, incorporating circularity more vigorously. Um, there in retail, especially in furniture retail, especially there is an opportunity to incorporate circularity by not only selling durable goods that will last a long time, but also offering repair and refurbishing services so that a consumer can keep a piece of furniture longer or so that a different consumer can take advantage of a product that someone else has used before. In, in my mind, furniture should be durable, it counts as a durable good, it should actually be durable. Less of it should be made of unrecyclable materials like MDF and made instead with solid materials. 
that lasts a long time and can be used generation unto generation, whether in the same family or not. Those are some challenges. Thank you, Suzanne. Rama, you're a distinguished urban designer, heavily involved in designing products that embrace circular practices. Can you share with us one common misconception about circularity? And then, can you tell us how product development differs for circular products versus more linear products? And then what would you regard as your most successful project so far and what made it so? Well, I think these are great, great questions. I have a feeling that we're going to be returning to questions around and around in a circular way, which I think is, uh, is really timely with this discussion. Um, um, I, a common misconception for me is, is, is that smaller scale is better um, in a circular economy. So this is an example of a, a piece I designed called the Sono Table, which uses Sono packing tubes and it's really about reuse and trying to pick up part of the supply chain and, and make a pattern that looks like cloisonne and um, is beautiful. And this of course helps in, in some ways to capture uh, things which would go to waste or to recycling, um, but it doesn't really deal with scale of production. So for me, a really big part of the circular economy is how do we take best practice and scale it up uh, to have the full impact? Um, uh, another, another project um, is uh, this one, which is called the Spiral Loop, um, which for me, uh, your question was, what, what would I regard as my most successful project so far? Um, uh, this is certainly in my top 10. Um, ironically, it didn't see huge mass production. It was designed for mass production, um, but it was actually in a pretty small show in the, in, in the Museum of Modern Art shops um, around locally made things. What it did though was because it was made um, in New York for New York, so made in the city for the city, um, is it had a major article in uh, the New Yorker with a, um, a cartoon with Paula Antonelli from the Museum of Art, Art holding it and its impact um, across uh, many influencers was strong. So for me, I think there's many different metrics to look at our work and, and the impact it has. So I've designed things where I've made tens of millions of the product, which have significant impact. But sometimes in our work, I think the inspiration that we can give to others through it is equally important. Thanks so much, um, Rama. Mark, sustainability affects your entire business, which materials to use, where you source them, how to manufacture, how to market and distribute. For a business just starting to become more circular, where do you recommend they start the journey? Uh, Dana, can I ask you to queue up our video? And I'll go to that in just a moment. Uh, you have to learn to listen to your partners. And I, I have a little anecdote. We make an effort to only deal with trees that are already felled or have to be cut down for our beautiful products for when schools are opening, when hospitals are uh, having their grounds cleared, or when there are lightning strikes. We partner with the Thai government and we perform a service of giving them revenue and we learn from them just how much of the tree can be saved. In the north of Thailand, we went and visited an elementary school and all the kids were sitting inside <clears throat> and they were playing on their iPads. And I asked them what this tree was, and they didn't know. And I asked them what this flower was and they didn't know. And I said, why weren't you outside? And they said, all of the playground material is rusted. We can't use it. It's dangerous. It's jagged. The swings are broken. The teeter doesn't totter. So we uh, made a deal if they could develop a course, because if this next generation doesn't know what's going on, how can we ever stop this? And we said, if you guys learn all the trees, we'll rebuild your playground. And we have a little bit of a video now, I think it's 59 seconds that shows our ethos and how we hope we can replace what has been removed with fast growing trees that are not threatened. Dana, do you have that accessible? Uh, 
Hmm. I don't know why it's not playing. All right. So okay. We, well, we, yes. we can go to Plan B. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's important for you to work with what you inherit. Years ago, we went to Haiti with an organization called Aid to Artisans in an attempt to develop enterprise with people who don't know how to use their resources. And they had plenty of oil drums, but they were making masks out of it that were horrific and not to the American taste. So we partnered with the Haitian craftspeople and created a series of lovely wall decor that was using whatever scarce material they had. Fast forward, to Thailand where we found mountains of out of commission oil drums and honey barrels. And in partnership with the Thai people bringing the knowledge we had where we, we were able to create enduring art, next slide if we can, that shows the character and celebrates the degradation of, of waste and material. This is dimensional art, it's simply done, it's inexpensive and it's been a tremendous great seller. But as we cut out these 12 circles from one 55 gallon barrel, we were left with circles that were wasted and this waste of the waste was killing us. So we came up with our Olympic spring wall decor, our Olympic wall decor screen. And you can see that this was the final step in not throwing out anything. They yielded more for their raw materials we have a story to tell, and it's an example of how every challenge is an opportunity. And uh, we want to make sure that partnering anywhere in the world, listen to your partners for what they have, what they can do, and help them with the design to bring it to market in the US. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Um, lensing. Let's talk about lensing. Lensing is an environmentally responsible sourcing um, company and, it, pro, and the production of environmentally responsible sourcing is core to what lensing does. Your company has been doing this for 80 years. Tencel is your patented textile. Can you tell us more about Tencel branded fibers, Lyocell and Model? Absolutely. So just a brief, uh, Lensing is an Austrian company who um, we source, we sustainably source woods. Um, and if you want to think about this, because I loved what Mark was saying about using trees that were like the byproducts or, uh, you know, hit by electric uh, lightning, etc. So we use trees as our raw material and PFC and FFC um, sourcing practices for farming, but we also want every, a uh, misconception is that the the good part of the tree gets used for for our our fibers well actually it's the the secondary parts um so if you imagine a tree and you cut out a beautiful piece of lumber for a beautiful piece of furniture you have all those cuttings away from it and those are the things that we use so the fallen trees all that that type of raw material so um i'm glad mark you you brought that up so um, it can put a, a little different picture on wood sourcing. From that, um, our, our woods are chipped and then dissolved, and 100% of that wood is used, between 40% for cellulose that we use, 10% for biorefinery products that we sell off for, you know, soaps and gu chewing gum and all these other chemicals that are reused in the food industry. And then the other part is biofuel. So we use the balance, the 50%, to um, run the factories. So it's renewable so, uh, sourced woods um, fiber. So um, then the other part of that is it's a closed loop production. So what does closed loop mean for Lyocell? It means that all the chemicals and waters and solvents that you use, you reuse. So we can recapture over 99% of the chemicals and the, um, the water to reuse in the process. So that's another form of circularity, just keeping it flowing within it. Um, for the production processes. And then, um, so with the, our fibers, they're used in everything from, you know, beauty face masks to sanitary napkins to denim to upholstery to window um, bedding, everything. Um, and it's Tencel is the brand that is the most recognized sustainable fiber brand. 
So with that, people have a sense of confidence in the branding. Um, the certifications that we issue don't go without um, testing. Um, so we bring a lot of things to it. But I think the, the important thing is we're starting from nature and we're ending with a biodegradable compostable product. Um, so we are not adding. Um, and later on, we'll talk about how we're actually taking some of that waste and using it. But um, I think that's the important thing for lensing what they do and how those fibers can give every product um, a more botanic start. Thank you, Walter. I'd like to check in with the audience. How is the conversation going for you? Please remember to write your questions in the Q&A section. Let's move on to how businesses of different sizes and types might incorporate circular practices. Rama, what do you see as the differences between small scale versus large scale businesses in how they incorporate circular practices? And how do you recommend each approach these challenges at a different scale? Well, firstly, Lawrence, um, uh, how you've put this together is so artfully done. Um, and I didn't really realize it until I've seen these presentations myself of our colleagues. Looking at Walter and Mark's presentation, um, in many ways, the, the, the argument that Mark put forward in his work was around um, how do we work with what is there? And, um, I, and, and you know, his practice is between small and, 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 and mid. Um, I think the, the, the interesting thing about his work, though, is I think if we see small practice as a laboratory, um, where it unearths the oil barrels, the problems, and how do we recognize that? And, and we look at um, large scale that Walter's presenting as the implementer. And of course they can change hats back and forth, but I think when small scale sees itself as a solution, um, it, 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 it really can't do that. And I think knowing the limits of how far you can take something in production, you know, with the amount of units and the impact it has is really critical. So I think if we look at small scale as really the way to see the world more clearly and to um, unearth the unintentional byproducts of design um, so that larger scale can design intentional byproducts. So the oil barrel companies are looking at a closed loop circular production, um, although that's an interesting metaphor to think of uh, oil as closed loop. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Rama. Walter, can you talk about innovations in the fiber arena at Lensing, like Tensile Lyocell Carbon Zero and Tensile Model X? Walter, you are muted. Sorry about that. So I'm gonna start with um, Tencel Model Indigo Color Technology. So that was just um, introduced a month ago. And that is an innovation where we are taking um, indigo inks and uh, dyes and infusing them in a dope dye process into the, lias, into the model fiber. What that does is it saves a ton of water. Everybody knows that doing um, indigo dyeing takes a ton of water and energy. So with us infusing it into it and figuring out a way to do it with an indigo color, it, um, it lasts. So you think about this. So denim couches, denim slip covers, you sit on them and you're wearing white pants, that blue comes off on you. This is an area where it's more environmentally friendly to bring the color to the fiber then through the use of the fiber, you're not transferring the color and you have better attributes at the end of the day. So that's, that's our most recent one and it's really geared towards the denim industry, but you can obviously see applications for um, indigo color in the home industry. Now, Carbon Zero is an in innovation that we did released back uh, November. And what's interesting about this is it's still a lyocell fiber which has all those great uses and all those great attributes. But what we've done is we've pushed back on our supply chain to affect where we're sourcing energies from and what they're doing about it so that it's more renewable, um, responsibly sourced energy. 
In addition to that, we took our own machinery and where we were using energy and we were being more efficient with it and putting things into place to have less energy loss. And then the third aspect to achieving carbon zero was to um, do offsets. So those offsets get us to, and they were focused around um, education in third world countries, et cetera. So those three things together have allowed us to bring a um, certified carbon zero fiber to the marketplace. So this really gives products a carbon zero start when in their, you know, the fabrics that they're using there. So those are the kind of innovations that we continue to challenge ourselves and um, bring out to meet our goals of being carbon zero by 2050. That sounds fantastic. Thank you, uh, Walter. Jason, Philips Collection, given the nature of your business, its size, its complexity, how have you incorporated circular practices in a way that suits your business? Okay, great. Uh, Donna, if you can, there we go, go to the first slide. Uh, so this is actually what dad was gonna show you in that video, uh, actual photos of the tree planting. And maybe you can just cycle through the next two images uh, so the audience can see uh, the full effort there. I'm gonna speak a little bit about how we use every part of the tree because I think the audience would find that interesting. So as we mentioned, we work uh, in Southeast Asia mainly and we have an obsession with using materials that don't harm the environment. So when a tree has to come down, uh, as dad mentioned, building a road or, or um, you know, just trees that are a blight on the landscape that make the land undevelopable. Uh, we use every part of the tree and we actually prefer not to find perfect pieces of wood. So we find roots, uh, stumps of trees or, or entire trunk sections that have dry rot in the middle. These are pieces that other industries can't uh, procure enough um, perfect material from. So we turn the trunks into console tables and coffee tables, uh, but that's not enough. So you have the branches and the roots and we carve those out and we unearth them and we have lots of furniture that is born from pieces of wood that are buried underground. Uh, how do we bring that full circle? Um, yeah, here's an amazing picture of a fire truck that we own uh, that power washes the sediment out of these roots so that we could cut them into various forms. Uh, but we're also paying attention to how we load the containers. How can we be as efficient as possible for what I think is the least sustainable part of our business, which is uh, international transportation? Uh, once it arrives, how do we pack it in a way that it won't break when it arrives to the customer? So there are all these layers and we're a bit obsessed and I think our customer base really appreciates that. So dad is kind of the magician, the Indiana Jones of the company finding innovative things and we have to bring it down to earth in many ways and make an oil drum wall decor um, understandable to the customer. And we found our customers love that story so it's our bent these days. We are uh, what I'd like to think as a leader within the furniture industry of doing unexpected things with materials. And I think we have a good brand allegiance as a result of that transparency and sharing that supply chain. Great, Jason. Uh, I love that metaphor. Uh, moving on to waste reduction and upcycling for low environmental footprint and still have you know, having aesthetics that consumers are seeking. Mark, can you give us an example of how waste is designed out of your production process? I know this is not a one-off effort, but ongoing and continual at Philips Collection. Could you share with our audience how that occurs with your company? Sure, this is part of our day-to-day -day thinking, and I can continue right on with the slides of Jason. We find a root that is buried. It's very hard to access. So we use the fire truck to blast away the rocks that get entangled in the roots so we can cut it out and fashion it into these incredible forms. We then take these pieces and come up with creative mountings to celebrate a piece that couldn't stand on its own or wouldn't see the light of day. So here we are raising the consciousness of this this is a bit of engineering and the beauty is I find some of these pieces and Jason with a degree in industrial design and, and Julie Phillips an architect and the talent we have bail me out and present these treasures in an attractive way. So my job is to find and their job is to present. 
Uh, we have steel shafts running through these pieces to create the balance. And all of a sudden we have something that's two-sided, conversation provoking and unique and would have spent its life degrading on the side of a river in the north of Thailand or Indonesia otherwise. Let's go to another slide. These are the roots of teakwood trees, little fragments of roots that we piece together into all sorts of practical forms. No two alike, but all can be created to the same dimension. One of the things that we're plagued with is how do we scale up a business that's primarily one of a kind? And if we can make the size conform and celebrate the differences in uniqueness and spirit of each piece, we can create a degree of volume that we hadn't previously thought of. And finally, if you can get to the next slide, this, I, I think I have to partner with Walter because he's appreciating our using the end cuts and I would appreciate figuring out how to use his prime center pieces that don't work for him. Um, when we get a trunk of a tree, it's easy to create an organic live edge slab out of the middle, those pieces that are good, but the end cuts where the piece curves are absolutely unusable for any table surface is used by Phillips Collection to create room dividers and incredible sculpture. This was the idea of a partner of ours in conjunction with Jason. A tree had been hit by lightning, it was blackened, and they're standing there with their chainsaw. And Jason says, what if you cut it here and here and here and here? And they took the idea and ran with it. And all of a sudden, an unusable piece is a major piece. It wasn't thrown out. It was, in fact, an inexpensive and great seller of ours. And I'm proud to say was last year's Pinnacle Art Award, uh, Pinnacle Award winner for the green leaf category. So. I know that the public appreciates this and the Sustainable Furnishing Council appreciates our efforts in this direction. Thank you, Mark, and what stunning pieces uh, indeed, and congratulations on the award. Walter, Thank you. you're welcome. Walter, can you give an example of lensing support in waste reduction and upcycling? Absolutely. Um, Lensing, as we mentioned before, continues to innovate. And this is a technology that we came out with um, a couple of years ago. And it's scalable, it's in mass production, it's used all over the place. Um, but what's interesting about it is, I mentioned before, we use primarily wood in our lyocell. Here, we're, we're alternating that and using 70% wood pulp in this lyocell, which means we're using less trees. But then also we're augmenting that that pulp with cotton waste. So you think about pre and con consumer cotton waste, which I think this goes back to designing in a single fiber makes recycling and upcycling and circularity much easier. So this is a prime example. So if you have a cotton blouse, you know it's easy to take the buttons off, but then you can take that cotton blouse, cut it up, and break it down into pulp. So, and then that pulp we blend with our wood pulp at a 70-30 to create a virgin fiber that is biodegradable, um, uh, uh, compostable, but yet it also has all the same attributes of the softness, the beauty, the luster, all the functions of a regular one. So we're doing two things. We're diverting trash that would have gone to landfills and we're using less wood um, in the production of this fiber. So it's really circular um, to that aspect and in, in really bringing in other people's waste into our process. So that's a great tensile last cell refibra um, and it's out available today for everybody to develop new new fabrics and and upholstery and all that good stuff. So that's what we're doing. Fantastic. I mean, what, a, what an innovative way uh, to process uh, this uh, product. Suzanne, given what we've heard from Philip Collections and Lensing about how they tackle the re reduction of waste, are there other members of the Sustainable Commission Council that you know of that have approached this problem differently? And if so, how? Uh, there sure are other members that are also showing leadership in this arena. And that's a good thing because um, there is so much waste here in the United States, 
6% of our landfill waste is furnishings and another 6% is textiles. So, and of course, some of that's fashion, but a lot of it is um, home textiles as well. So it's important for us all to reduce waste any and every way we can. One of our members called Sabai Designs is um, implementing the first take back program in this country in the US. And so they actually have a program for taking back a piece of furniture that they might have sold to you a couple of years ago. Um, they are doing their production in North Carolina and they are using a lot of recycled materials in the production of this line of upholstered furniture, um, which is uh, in components and they will, as I said, take it back, which is a real pioneering concept that um, has challenged many retailers, but since they're direct to consumer, they've been able to do it. Um, another company that I'll mention is an organization called the Good Future Design Alliance, which has a goal of reducing waste to landfill of 50% within five years. It's an alliance of design firms. And they are not only reducing waste, but they are also selling products that have come out of design projects so that they can be used for something else and, uh, and frequently by other designers. Designers are great at finding things that can be used longer. And I think that that's probably one reason designers love Phillips collection so much. They really get this concept of, of using and reusing, of salvaging in so many ways. Um, there are, of course, Sustainable Furnishings Council members that are regular manufacturers of regular furniture, but some of those, like Lazy Boy, are zero waste to landfill in their factories. And that, on the subject of scale that Rama has touched on several times, is a remarkable thing. When a very large furniture manufacturer can manage to keep all the waste from their factories out of the landfill, rather recycling them and making other uses of them, that's a really good thing. There are Sustainable Furnishings Council members that were actually founded to make use of a waste. Um, Fair Mob makes metal furniture. It is all recycled metal, and it is a way of adding tremendous value to scrap metal, which again, Phillips Collection knows a lot about. Um, it's, uh, another example like that of just starting with the material is Enviro leather, which is not a bonded leather, but is made of leather scrap in a different way that is not um, that is uh, using compression instead of chemicals to make a tannable leather product. And then there are many um, Sustainable Furnishings Council members that make use of salvaged materials. Cisco Brothers does, Home Trends and Designs. And in urban wood, um, Cambium Carbon is a company that is making sure the resource is available to industries like to us in the furniture industry. And Room and Board is really leading in using urban wood, salvaged urban wood, in products that are not necessarily live edge tables. They are um, using dimensional lumber that comes out of urban settings, often trees that have to be cut down, often buildings that have to be torn down. So um, they are an example of a retailer making a difference with their specifying. And I do want to point out that many Sustainable Furnishings Council members that are retailers are making great strides in simply recycling the waste that comes into their um, businesses. Packaging waste is a really big deal in the furniture industry. And when retailers insist that their vendors use a recyclable material or a, at least a single um, 
material. So don't use six different kinds of plastic welded together, makes it impossible for it to be recycled. Rather choose one that would work and then it'll be possible for it to be recycled. So there are, of course, many ways in which uh, Sustainable Furnishings Council are members are reducing waste. And I'm sure I've left out lots of them because there are 400 examples. But thank you for asking that. You are so welcome, Suzanne. And you know, thank you so much for sharing all of this super valuable information. Um, it makes uh, me uh, think that um, I just want to mention that I'm a very proud ambassador for the Sustainable Furnishing Council, such a fantastic organization, and you know, really encouraging anyone. Uh, in the audience, you know, to who can, you know, and is in the industry to join um, the Sustainable Furnishing Council as a member. Uh, Walter, beyond uh, lensing, what services do you provide and how are you helping providers, distributors, manufacturers in your supply chain to help become more circular? Yeah, so we are, our primary focus is making mid-made cellulosic fibers. So that's that's the primary thing there. But we're at the beginning of the supply chain and a, we know it goes everywhere. But how do you encourage the end consumer to want to look for that label and want to seek out fi you know, products made with Tencel branded fibers? So we, we take the approach of push-pull so we're out there consumer marketing facing and educating the consumer on better choices through our um, Feel So Right campaign and other campaigns that we do consumer facing. Then beyond that, you talk about a new, new retailer or a startup company and they don't know where to go for you know, connecting to mills. So fortunate for us, we sell to spinners. Spinners sell to weavers and knitters. Knitters they sell make fabrics and those fabrics get made into other products so we're involved all throughout the supply chain through certifying the fabrics that they're made so that that, that it can carry the name can sell which makes it easier for the end consumer to recognize the they're getting a quality product there um, there's transparency there's sustainability all those things inherent to that branded ingredient so our services are testing um innovations and helping educate the consumer and the supply chain on using these fibers in the right way to maximize a great product everybody will be happy with and it's environmentally friendly and sustainable. Jason, beyond Philips collection, I know you work with a number of partners, especially local communities, to expand circularity and social impact. Would you describe what you do and how it works? Absolutely. Yeah. So on one end of the spectrum, we have an obsession with telling the story of how we source our interesting materials uh, and how we create beautiful designs from that. But we're also very involved in the community. Uh, we've been fortunate to grow a lot over the years and here in High Point, North Carolina, where real estate is more accessible. We've uh, purchased a few buildings. And the first thing we do is we go in and we replace all of the light bulbs, uh, usually fluorescent bulbs. And here we've, um, well, I'll come back to this slide, but if you go to the next one, uh, you're gonna see something kind of fun. Uh, we've even branded this effort to uh, responsibly dispose of fluorescent bulbs, which have off gassing if you don't capture it properly. So we even branded this tube that we put it into waste not, want not. And uh, we got the whole company involved and we got local news coverage. So there's a nice marketing component, but it's really just important to us. Um, there are many other ways to be sustainable locally. Susan touched on becoming a zero waste uh, company domestically, and it's something we are certainly aiming towards. Uh, we, we actually get paid to have our, re our recycled cardboard picked up by waste management. We, we didn't even realize that was an area of profit for us. Uh, we also, have adopted our street, which has proven to be a much easier and more gratifying task than we ever imagined. Uh, basically, you have to make a commitment to every other month cleaning up a half mile strip outside of your business. 
And I, I, my hope is that this inspired others around us. So we've donated to local children's museums. In fact, uh, large-scale brontosaurus and tyrannosaurus rexes, literally. Um, one of our factories produces those. So we've become a steward in the community and put a lot of responsibility on ourselves to do whatever we can locally. Uh, what I'd like to, I guess my closing remark on this is companies, if you don't have a senior leadership group um, focused on sustainability, you have a much uh, larger battle to incorporate this into the business. But we luckily have our entire leadership team uh, bent on this. So we are very uh, active and, and dad is very enthusiastic about new endeavors locally. So things have to be profitable for a company. What we've stumbled across is where being sustainable might cost us a little bit more. The amount of customer loyalty and new customer acquisition has made it all worthwhile. So this is, I think, the most important part of our business practice. How can we look at every inch of our uh, processes and improve it? And I'll, I'll just give a quick kudos to Susan and Laurence, who uh, are ultimately, uh, Susan's the educator uh, to, the, to the manufacturers, to us, and Laurence is the educator to the public. So we rely very heavily on both ends of that to get our message out. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, Rama, for early in your career, you've been drawn toward teaching. You're an associate professor at the School of Construction at the new school. And I know teaching has affected your perspective on sustainability. You have experienced partnering with other countries in your teachings and practices. Could you describe how you partner with other governments and in particular a current existing project that also involves your students? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I I'll just briefly start out with the with the teaching. Um, I came to teaching. I'm 51. I started teaching when I was 30, um, and I did it really at the at a at a kind of breakthrough moment in my career when I had my first exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, where I had work there. And a lot of my colleagues said, you know, what are you doing? You need to really focus on your practice. Um, in the United States, so, so much of teaching design is separated from practice. Um, but in other fields, if you're, um, you know, if, if you want to go to the best doctor, you go to a teaching hospital. Um, if you want to look at sort of best business practice, um, most of the senior faculty are, are, are business people teaching at Ivy League schools. Um, so I've really looked towards that, the balance of, of design and teaching as a kind of sacred space to imagine what design could be um, and, and then inflect upon what design also is. So this is a view out my window. I often show slides of ships passing by um, from the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, this is where Frank Alva Parsons lived. Actually, he lived a block from where my house is, and I also teach at Parsons, where he saw the Great Depression and the ships passing. Um, this is during COVID, where I see a, the bow line very high on a, on a Maersk ship, um, because we're, we're not exporting at this time, and we're looking at import and export. And so in teaching, it's a space where I feel very little guilt in my work, because I'm really helping students imagine what the possibilities of the world could be. Part of those possibilities are going around the world um, to look at what the world is. So the new school is the most international school in the United States, um, possibly the world. And um, you know what is local for us is hard to define because we're really all over the place. So some of the partnerships that we've worked on, um, <clears throat> I was looking at this um, amazing work from Thailand, and I think I know the places where the logs are from, and it um, looks like there's some Chiang Mai in there and some different regions. Um, but we've taken groups of students to Thailand um, with support from uh, Chula Longkorn and the Thai government, where students have presented to Thai government officials and brought their work back looking at um, the viability of bamboo um, as a, as a product source material, um, and also how to encapsulate uh, carbon in bamboo much as you can with wood in a, in a, in a more long-term way. Um, that, that humble material, um, one of our students who worked with it won um, Best of Design Week um, when he presented a simple toy made out of bamboo, which you know, sort of came as no surprise to us. Other projects, other international projects, 
we did a recent project um, called the Earth Manual Project with the Japan Foundation, where we worked um, um, with, with constituents in Japan, um, Japanese universities as well, looking at um, how to prepare for disaster. And that was through a traveling exhibition, which I had seen um, with uh, Brian McGrath, who was instrumental in bringing me to Thailand as well, and other faculty um, at the New School, where um, we looked at how to prepare for disaster, um, which has really become salient with, um, with, with COVID in the moment. Um, a current major work that's been a multi-year project, um, which I think many of our projects are intertwined with across these um, the, the Danish green tech hub is with um, uh, the Danish consulate in New York. And Parsons has had a, a multi-year agreement um, working with Danish institutions around questions of sustainability and circularity. Um, we're, we're currently working on a, a, a major multi-year project with the, with the UN SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, where we've had, last year we had a major symposium um, and we're um, um, working on current projects now, which is incredibly exciting to us to continue. Um, and I think I'll end it there to give more space. Thank you, Rama. What incredible, exciting projects. Thank you for describing those. Very, very exciting. Susan, as you see your SFC members at different points in the journey, what would be your list of pitfalls to avoid? Um, one of the pitfalls to avoid is thinking you've got to be perfect immediately. So I would I encourage all individuals as well as all companies to not worry about immediate perfection. Do not let us, uh, aspiring for the perfect get in the way of being good. The first 10% of any change effort is the most difficult. Let yourself take small steps and um, appreciate that that small steps do make a difference and soon small steps can be much larger steps. And I'm sure that our member companies that are on this call as well as others could give um, their own um, uh, internal examples of that. The other thing that I will say is um, uh, uh, that is about, that is the main thing I'm gonna say. Um, and uh, uh, so just trust that the steps that you're going to take are going to make a difference and know that small steps lead to larger steps. As you can see, I, was, I think I had something else to say on that. I might remember it. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, panelists, just checking in with the audience, please make sure to um, follow all our panelists on the social, but uh, we will address your questions in a few minutes. Just two final questions very quickly. Moving your business to be a more circular approach seems overwhelming to many people. What would be one practical ideas you would recommend that a manufacturer, an architect or designer could start with? Any other panelists who would like to, to answer? Sure, since I'm at the beginning of the, the supply chain, I would say learn your suppliers and what sustainability actions they're producing in there um, and capitalize on it and loop that in. Make those easy choices to partner with people supplying you with more sustainable actions and products. I will um, affirm that and I will point out that about 80% of the environmental impact of any product comes from what it's made of. So asking what's it made of is a very important, um, simple thing to do. Ask what's it made of. I'll also just weigh in that um, there are experts out there like Susan across different industries, even if, if you were to tap into Walter, I'm sure he has a wealth of knowledge, even if your questions about a different industry. So you can do your own research, but there are experts out there that could probably tell you 25 things you could do to start being more sustainable and, and aware 
and how to communicate that to your audience to get more brand loyalty. And I'd just like to say, uh, you should partner with those that cherish and you should celebrate rather than complicate. Beautiful. Um, likewise, if you could give one piece of advice to a consumer wanting to shop and source more responsibly for themselves, what would that be? For uh, me, uh, oh, go ahead, Walt. Oh, I was just going to say real quick is read the labels. It's kind of like that campaign uh, years ago when in the grocery store you want to read the labels, what's the first ingredient. That would be the key thing for any uh, training or developing any consumer messaging is read the labels to know what you're buying. And I was related to that going to say, seek out those that have a story to tell. If they're telling a story, it's probably what you should be learning. Yeah. What's it made of and who made it? I think consumers um, do well to know who they're doing business with. Yeah, if I can add to that, that the, um, um, you know, I think what's being said is also what's the intention of the, of the designer and the producer and where they're going. And it can be very difficult to read, you know, to read a book by its cover sometimes. So it does take some digging if, if you can't read it quickly. Um, I was unaware that Lazy Boy is a zero waste production, and it's incredibly exciting to see that it's not a Lazy Boy that's doing it. I'm, you know, excited to see what Lazy Susan's going to be doing next. Um, but what we, um, you know, in seeking out the companies and the designers and the interior designers in which you're doing our spaces, I think the most important is what is their intention? And again, to build upon that it's not it's not perfect that we're all working towards something. Fantastic. Thank you, panelists. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions from our audience. We have about five, 10 minutes left. And if you have a question, please write it in the Q&A section again. Dana, did any questions come in? Yes, we have one from Pamela Francis, which is, do you see the landscape of furniture circularity changing? I am in commercial design and have not found any large providers who will take responsibility for furniture at the end of life. I send clients to those who will refurbish and recycle as a result. I avoid the big firms that will only go to a landfill. When will this change? Anyone? I will um, uh, say that I think one thing that pushes change is legislation. And um, there are, there, uh, our partner in lobbying is the American Sustainable Business Council. We are um, getting some traction in moving towards legislation to reduce plastic waste. Um, I, but I think that that is, we see in this realm an example for um, more use of legislative muscle. So that's one answer. I think though that, that on our panel here today, we've heard um, lots of encouragement. Um, so I hope that the person asking the question is, is feeling more optimistic now than an hour ago, because I do think change is happening organically and responsible legislation will help. Yeah, and, and also to add to this, to this point, um, not going to the big firms because you know, it will just go to the landfill. Um, certainly there could be truth in that with some companies, but I think the larger scale production, much of it is being designed for disassembly. Um, and if we look across you know, companies like Human Scale, for example, where they're really looking deeply at their supply chain and how it's disassembled. And then I think the leading companies are really looking at you know, design for repairability as a service, where if something breaks, you can send a part back, it's recycled, it's fixed. And last, to build upon the question of policy, which is the fundamental question. You know, if you're in Germany, by law, the entire Mercedes-Benz, the company is responsible for their car after it's produced and they keep track of the parts and the, that, that cycle. And that can only happen through, through legislation. Great. Um, on the topic of commercial furnishings, Stephanie McCartney wondered, 
I work in commercial furnishings, corporate, military, government, healthcare, education, laboratory, et cetera. Is there a sustainable furnishings council for commercial furniture? There is an organization in commercial furniture called BIFMA, which stands for Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association. And they are a friend of, of Sustainable Furnishings Council, which does focus more on residential. BIFMA has a certification called the Level Certification. And it has uh, been very influential in driving positive change throughout that, um, throughout that sector. And there is lots of overlap in what um, the BIFMA level uh, requires for certification and in the standards that Sustainable Furnishings Council espouses and educates about. Thank, thank you, Susan. Um, next, we have Catherine Wieland wondering, regarding recyclable fibers for consumer furnishings, how do consumers go about recycling them? How does that work exactly? Thank you. So I think that's geared towards um, Tencel and Lyocell and our Model fibers. So if it's 100%, so think about a sheet and it's 100% Tencel Lyocell available all over the place, um, you can buy that. You can either cut it up and compost it and put it in your garden. Um, or even if it does go to a, um, a landfill through the garbage um, area, it will biodegrade faster than what cotton does. Um, and then obviously definitely better than, um, it, well, plastics don't, but um, those are the ways that it can be done. But the th you got to think about 100% because we're only talking about our fiber. A lot of it gets blended. So if you blend with cotton, great. You know, those are both biodegradable and compostable uh, fibers. But think about something that's 100% 100% uh, polyester. This is where the opportunity is to start shifting out of things being 100% polyester. Um, Granted, you still need some of that for some of the attributes that it brings, but blend in some biodegradable materials so that when that does go to the landfill, at least half of it goes away or a quarter of it versus 100% staying there. So that's what I would say about, you know, thinking about fibers and, and fabrics that you're developing and adding and using. How can you shift them? You may not be able to shift 100%, but shift some to um, a more environmentally friendly end of life uh, fiber. Thank you, Walter. Um, next, we have Bailey Selig, who asks, how do you get clients to prioritize sustainable textiles and low VOC products? It's always the first thing to get cut for budget reasons. Um, I will say that uh, we know from Sustainable Furnishings Council consumer research that though all of us are going shopping with whatever our taste is and whatever our budget is. We do want eco-friendly when possible. 90% of us would choose eco-friendly and even a higher percentage in the, in the design forward um, uh, audience, which is probably what this audience is. So I would say uh, look for those low VOC, no VOC options that are available. I mean, VOC specifically, the, um, there are many, many options that didn't exist when we started 15 years ago. And those options do not cost a lot more. Cost gets added when there is certification to pay for. And that is a very important thing to pay for. It's valuable to have a third party certifier. But in furnishings, frequently the thing that is certified is a component rather than the entire product. And that means that you can get certified components for making your piece of furniture without adding a lot of cost to the entire piece of furniture. So my answer to the question is take heart and look closer, You're, you will find an inexpensive options, I believe. If you have trouble, ask me. I, I would add Thank to that, you. that supply chains for like a fabric, um, upholstery fabric, you know, 
Tencel and Lysel didn't really wasn't playing in that arena up until very very recent. So the more that you're asking for it um, with your suppliers, it's like what is an option out there that has fabrics or or chemical less, less chemicals in it. Um, and I think that's where it starts is really pushing back, asking for those options to build into your design. That's right. Um, not only consumer demand, but designers, you know, interior architects, architects demand to manufacturers. Absolutely. Uh, Dina, maybe one more question and then we'll have to wrap up. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Pelly Edmister is asking, I work as an interior designer for the nation's largest retail furniture store. I'm aware of the manufacturers we carry who are members of the SFC, but what can I do to convince my employer that they could benefit from doing more to promote circularity in the retail industry? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. I saw that question come in from Kelly and I think it's very topical. This sort of ties back to is the leadership uh, at this company already invested in this and, and uh, supportive of this. If not, which it's more sounding like that's the case or unaware, uh, I think some sort of internal forum where people could share ideas uh, at a company-wide level, whether it has to be anonymous if you're worried about job protection, uh, but it sounds like you're working for a company that is uh, has half, uh, has let's say one foot in and maybe not both. And uh, just be realistic about how and where uh, it would be appropriate to start the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, so we have reached the end of our panel discussion. Great insights here on circular practices in the design, architecture, and furnishings industry. Building awareness, influencing our counterparts, power in partnerships and collaborations. Um, continuing to upping the game in waste management and uh, zero emission. Seek opportunity in repair, reused, upcycled, repurposed, renewable materials for future opportunities are some of my takeaways here. I would like to sincerely thank the panelists, Suzanne, Walter, Mark, Jason, and Rama for all their wisdom. Thank you to my team, Dana, my colleague who has done a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes, as well as Abby, to make this event possible and thank you to the audience for your time and thoughtful questions. Enjoy the rest of Circular City Week. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye.